Hello, everybody. Um, you know, thank you very much for joining. You know, our our surviving a recession session. Um, you know, my name is John Bedewan, and I'm the entrepreneur in residence at Beta. Um, you know, with cooperation of Launch Minnesota, we created a five session series of candid conversations, which we named as Surviving a Recession. And so our idea here is to these sessions is, you know, uh, you know, we like to, we will not talk about why something happened to us, like why pandemic happened to us. I think lots of conversations went there. So what we like to do is we like to talk about how we become resilient, responsive and flexible during hard times. And we'll talk about how we create responses that transform our teams, ourselves, and our companies uh, during these times. And so in order to do that, we like to engage with founders, you know, uh, who led their teams through crisis. And so our first, you know, uh, session of five uh, sessions, uh, we, are, you know, we are bringing Mitch Kupet from Code42. And, and we call this name of the session is the Adventures of Code 42 post 9-11. And, you know, Mitch is the founder of Code 42, Ramble, and now he's the CTO of uh, Branch. And then he grew for Code 42 from three people in a basement at 200 million plus revenue and 500 plus employees. And I think he will give, you know, a quick background much more uh, better than I'm doing. So, what I'm trying, I'm planning to do right now is I want to give the stage to Mitch, and and then we will start a conversation, and I will ask some questions to Mitch uh, during the process, and we can do a Q and A at the end, or if you if some questions that you really want to ask, you know you can raise your hand, and then we will let you uh, speak, and so we are looking forward to have a you know a very interactive and you know a wonderful session. And again, thank you, Mitch, for joining our session. And the stage is yours. All right. Well, uh, thanks, John. And uh, yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, big fan of the beta program. Uh, I've uh, watched a number of companies go through there, invested in a number of companies that have gone through there. So uh, uh, I put my money where my mouth is, not just uh, standing up here talking. Uh, uh, my money is definitely invested with companies that have gone through the beta program. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Uh, Code 42 really started back uh, in 2001. We started getting going though about 2002. And uh, my background is software engineering. Uh, been working with uh, computers since uh, the age of nine. Always knew that was something I was going to be doing in, in my life. So super, super passionate about building great products uh, with technology. Uh, once we founded Code 42, uh, really found that the journey to from being a software-minded uh, founder to being a true business leader, that's a, quite a journey. Um, I would say if I could book in Code 42, um, most important lesson I learned was you can do a lot of things wrong as long as you do one thing very, very right. Uh, and so I'm sure a lot of you can relate to the experiences of trying things, experimentation, finding that doesn't work. And then you kind of latch onto something and it just really propels your business. And then where it gets tricky is where <laughs> you start going, well, if I can do that, so well, maybe I can also do this other thing. And you find out that, well, maybe you should have stuck to the other thing that you were doing really well and not get distracted. Um, but the good news is that, uh, you know, which is why I think it was uh, you know, really interesting that uh, Sean reached out to me is that, Code 42 actually survived a number of, uh, you know, uh, market crashes. Uh, we literally started out in the dot-com crash, then made it through the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and now, uh, I've, after having uh, left Code 42 and been in the startup scene with an artificial intelligence company, and now I'm over at Branch, which is a fintech high growth company, uh, I get to see yet another downturn in the market. Uh, this one's pretty unique, so uh, this is gonna be a fun conversation. Thank you, Mitch. So what I would like to do is, you know, uh, you know, I will roll back to the dot-com bubble burst because you start your company around that time because, you know, like I started my first company, you know, just, you know, two months after the, you know, Lehman Brothers fell, you know, uh, failed. And, and I was starting the company and then there was this news came and I, I remember this all the time. And the guy in the news talking about saying that, I don't know any crazy people who start business at this climate and I was starting my business. And 
And so, you know, so I will never forget that. So it's a kind of, a, you know, I tell it to everybody. So what was your experience funding Code 42 in the wake of the dot-com bubble burst? And yeah, well, I th- I what were you thinking? Yeah, uh, well, first, uh, we were at a dot-com and the bubble was bursting internally. So uh, they were uh, imploding, um, people were leaving, and we basically looked at it as uh, an opportunity to say, hey, uh, my two other founders, Matthew and Brian, were also at this company. And in fact, one of the people online here, Irfan, was also at that company. So, hi, Irfan. <laughs> um, and, and, and we looked at each other and said, hey, you know what? Uh, we seem to work well together. Um, we'd like to continue that. You know, maybe this business side of the house isn't that hard for us. You know, we're, we seem to be pretty smart folks. You know, how hard could the business part be? And uh, it's hard. It's really hard. That's uh, definitely learned that lesson. But uh, we started out not really knowing what we were getting ourselves into. Uh, we wanted to just, uh, you know, continue doing technology. So we started out in consulting. Uh, we were looking at projects that we could do. And what was really interesting was that the dot-com burst, you have to look at, like, why something is crashing as opposed to just the fact that everything's crashing. And the value that was driving the bubble didn't go away. That's the most important thing to kind of take away from this. But unfortunately, a lot of hype and a lot of, uh, you know, un, you know, found, un, you know, just very non-solid business plans were funded. And so those things evaporated when the bubble burst. But just because those things weren't smart investments doesn't mean that the internet was a bad investment, right? And so companies that did have good strong foundations, they were still, you know, investing. They were still seeing the value. But a lot of the ecosystem uh, around these, uh, you know, VC-backed companies, um, that was getting pretty thin. But the silver lining to that was that uh, a lot of engineers who were paid top dollars also became available and affordable to a small company like Code42. And we were able to hire some of the best engineers that, and literally when we started, we thought there's no way we could hire these folks. And fast forward about six months, nine months into our startup, uh, we were talking to people that were literally just looking to work. Uh, before that, they were top dollar uh, senior engineers. And by the time we started landing deals with Sun Country Airlines, Target, and Great Clips, uh, we were able to find folks that uh, uh, were happy to work with us at rock bottom prices, simply because we could provide work. So one of the things that I took away from that is, hey, you know, the, when you are building a company and you start in a recession or a down market, uh, you have to remember that your competition is way lower and the cost of doing business drops. So those are really good things for a company that can find the right business and find the value in the down market. Oh, that's, that's, you know, that's great. That, indeed, that's the, you know, uh, the way that looking at that, you know, challenge and finding opportunities. I think that's, you know, uh, what you did. I think that's, you know, and push your company forward, and then you sign those, you know, uh, large clients. Uh, you know, uh, I think that's you know, uh, great learning experience. And uh, you know, how did you approach these, you know, uh, you know, uh, less costly, you know, engineering teams? And you know, if you know, because I think this is this is this. You know, I don't know the technology side with this pandemic. You know, will you know bring lots of technology people? you know, their costs below. But again, there are lots of other people that we can have more access now uh, because, you know, uh, we, we don't have 3.5% un- unemployment rate anymore. Uh, so as a small company, how do you reach these, you know, yeah. highly talented people? Oh. You know, what was your, you know, hook? We had friends. They were engineers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were very expensive engineers. And we simply asked them, hey, what are you doing? Are you, you know, would you be interested in uh, working with us? We're doing a startup. And initially people were saying no. And then because we had asked them and then they were, you know, out of work or they were going to see that they were going to soon be laid off, uh, people started reaching out to us. And we hired like a handful of folks uh, uh, right as we were landing some pretty decent contracts. And that became the core founding team of Code42. That's great. That's yeah. Amazing. And in this day and age, I mean, just letting people know that, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, you may not think that you can afford them, but just having, uh, you know, probing your network, asking folks what they're up to, that never hurts. And people know then that uh, you might be looking. 
And in this day and age, I mean, everything's so connected. Back then, uh, email was the primary vehicle of communication. Um, there weren't things like LinkedIn. There weren't social, you know, you know, media where you could like get your message out there really fast. But uh, yeah, I think uh, you know sometimes the obvious thing that's right underneath your nose, you just make sure do those people know that you're uh, you have an opportunity for them. Yeah. You know, the, the one thing that one of my mentors told me, you know, uh, when I first came to the United States, one of my professors, he said, you know, John, if you want to be an entrepreneur and if you want to, you know, survive in the United States, the one thing you need to learn is you need to always ask. And so, you know, at the worst case, what will happen is they will get, you will get right. them know and you will be in the same place before you ask. So it's not Absolutely like, right. yeah, you don't go very so, far if you don't ask. And you yeah, don't put always it ask guys, you know. Yeah. And like, like I said, you know, you know, if there are founders on this channel or whoever, you know, always ask that question. And I think, you know, uh, you know, getting a no answer, you know, is part of our life. Uh, um, 95% of the time we get no. So you only need one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We only need one. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And so, um, so Mitch, do you have any, you know, uh, kind of advice from the dot com bubble besides, you know, uh, find the, you know, cheaper talent and, you know, uh, be resilient. Any, anything that comes in your yeah. mind before we jump to the next recession? Yeah, it's just really that, that you want to, you know, understand that uh, market collapses don't change the value of, of need uh, that have, you know, preceded the collapse. Uh, a lot of times these things happen for, um, you know, unrelated reasons like the current situation. Um, uh, even in a dot-com collapse, uh, markets drop you know they don't they don't go away they drop and that's probably a good way to look at it. and they come back and so over the cycle if you can survive the drop and you can really focus yourself and find the value for example we back in 2001 we found that hey there still is a demand for uh people who can get websites stood up that have e-commerce backends uh can talk to legacy systems which is where we really started cutting our teeth and the fact that we were pretty uh, you know, fast moving, uh, you know, experienced group of engineers that could stand up projects quickly that, uh, you know, were uh, high quality, uh, you know, software solutions. Uh, there's always a demand for something like that. But specifically at that time frame, people were still seeing that, hey, we would like to get this web, you know, application out there. Who can do it for us? Because all these other companies had dried up because of the dot com bust. So, uh, value doesn't go away. It just might look diminished or might be harder to find. That's great feedback. Thank you very much. So what I will do is I will jump to the, you know, the 2008 great recession. And so as called 42, you know, uh, you know, how did you, you know, uh, you know, first of all, were you expecting that there was a recession coming as a CEO or this like caught you like by, you know, you know, surprise like one of a sudden you said oh, oh lemon brothers went down everything is going down we are in fire and so how do you you know respond to you know the you know great recession especially you know after lemon brothers failed and then all the you know mortgage industry and maybe you had some financial clients which you know uh, they were in big trouble and so how uh, how was your experience in 2008 great recession yeah, so um, up to that point, uh, we were a consulting company, and then in 2007, we launched a product that really put us on the map. Uh, it was a backup product called Crash Plan. Uh, it was one of the first uh, consumer-grade backup products. This is before the cloud was a big deal, and people were backing up photos. You know, they had photos, they were recording movies, and there really was no solution if your hard drive crashed. You lost these things, and it really sucked. So we launched a, a personal backup product in 2007. It really took off quite you know amazingly fast and so in 2008 we said hey you know what uh, maybe we want to launch this into the business space too and because there's a lot of laptops showing up in the business places um we were probably not that sophisticated to realize what a market collapse uh you know like while we had built a business we didn't really understand the, the nature of the collapse around us um I would say that luck sometimes just plays a really big factor and that's, you know, it's, that's not a helpful tip for the people on board. Uh, but uh, what we were able to you know, notice was that uh, despite the fact that things were collapsing, uh, we found that 
there were certain value props that were very becoming more important. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, you know oversight governance of these companies those became you know the telltales of hey how did this happen in the first place right there's poor governance there's poor oversight uh, what are these companies doing just you know, you know running amok and what came out of that was a backlash of hey you know we need to have better governance we need to have better compliance. Uh, and we sort of fell right into the sweet spot of disaster recovery and data protection. And because we were providing uh, backup and, and you know, very sophisticated uh, data recovery for uh, executive machines, for knowledge workers, uh, this started becoming a, a, you know, a real pain point for IT workers when they're like, well, you know, we actually don't know what's on those machines. So, People started showing up uh, asking for a solution that we had. Um, that said, though, um, you know, how did we get there? Uh, we started with, a, and we were still pretty small, we were just starting to get going. Um, I think a lot of times it's just, like you said, you have to take in a lot of no's. And we had to land our first, uh, you know, really our first influencer. Um, there was a person by the name of Noah Abramson who ran the biological division at Stanford University. And we had uh, gotten some, you know, noise out in the, you know, just in the internet on forums and people were talking about crash plan as a consumer product. And Noah had a specific problem. He started realizing that there were a lot of Mac laptops showing up uh, in the, on campus and he had no good solution for the Mac laptops. Uh, he had PC stuff covered. PC has been around for a long time. By the way, this is a really important point, is that Max at that point in time only accounted for like maybe like, a, you know, sub 1% of the PC market. And so we ended up, uh, you know, we had a great backup product that worked on Max. Noah actually ends up selecting that for uh, Stanford. And little did we know that that was going to create a domino effect. And so because Noah was feeling this effect, he wanted to make sure he had full coverage, disaster recovery. Noah was also well connected to the people at Apple and also to the people at Genentech, which is one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical bio co companies on the planet. And because he felt that we were doing such a great job backing up his Max, uh, he recommended us to both of those companies. Uh, Genentech became our first enterprise company uh, that uh, was running a crash plan as for business. And then because Genentech ran it, uh, slowly of course time we were then able to get Apple. Now this took a course of like, you know, 12 months to get these deals through. Enterprise is a really slow move, you gotta be patient. But ultimately that started the, we, because we started with an influencer, from the influencer we were able to get our first customer. And from our first customer, we were able to get a second customer. Uh, that really got the ball rolling. At a time when most companies were like, just figuring out like, you, they would have thought you were crazy to start a, a software company during that time. Well, that's, well you know, one thing is, you know, I always, you know, tell, you know, when I talk to founders and, and any startup, you know, the importance of, importance of reference client, like, yes. you know, your first seven clients are so critical. Like you need to make them extremely happy because those are your leverage clients. And then, you know, you can do all the marketing in the world. You can do all the, you know, uh, you know, sales teams you, you get, but a using client, talk to another client sells way faster than, you know, uh, any, any kind of, you know, marketing or sales effort. So, uh, I think that's a great example. I think I, I think most uh, under, uh, on this you know right now in this conversation, I think taking notes about it, like how can I find that influencer or reference client that I can leverage and you know yeah. go to Apple or go into the next big company that you know uh, we can become. So, so there's a uh, one other point. Um, if if you were to ask me during the time of COVID forty two, like what was the reason for success, I would have said things like, oh, we have an amazing team. You got this great insight on the market. I was just talked about all these things that were really, you know, that were in our control. Um, having been away from it a while now, uh, I would say that there's this thing that I call the market tailwind. And if you can align yourself to a market tailwind, this is where you can uh, maybe at least be aware of where luck might favor you. Um, the luck here was that Max just started taking off. Executives liked Max developers started liking Max. And now you can't go anywhere without seeing Max everywhere, right? So 
uh, we were one of the first ones to provide an IT disaster recovery solution that worked at scale for businesses who needed to support max. And then the max went from 1% to 2% to 10% to 20%. And if you really look at uh, you know, uh, Code 42's growth trajectory, it, it really follows the success of max in, in the business place. And so when I look back now with that insight, um, and even at branch, uh, I try to, uh, make sure I'm, I'm thinking and I'm very aware of what is the market tailwind that we should be aligning ourselves to now. So that's one other point I would point out is that, um, you know, you can start out in a very small market so long as there's some massive growth and you're aligning yourself to that market's growth you will probably grow too. Yeah, you know, there are lots of, you know, uh, face mask companies are crazy growing now. You know, it just, you know, uh, you know, some companies are struggling. You know, I know some, you know, medical device companies, you know, uh, especially with the smart, you know, uh, sensors and smart textile. And uh, now they are developing these very cool face masks, but, you know, uh, but, you know, uh, their business are crazy booming. So, yeah. And so I think that brings us into the you know state of today. Yeah, and it one thing is that you know let's let's talk about today. Like, how does your experience influence your approach with the current pandemic? And you know how are you you know running you know as the CTO of Branch? You know uh, you know what are you doing there right now? Like, how is your approach? What's going on? And yeah. how are you responding to the current pandemic? So uh, I ended up joining, I actually, so I'll give you a little backdrop on, on Branch. Uh, after Ramble, uh, so Code 42 was definitely a win. Uh, I ran another startup in artificial intelligence called Ramble, uh, raised seed money. Uh, we got a lot of good, you know, uh, initial uh, traction, but ultimately I had to shut it down back in January of 2019. And so now I'm officially a real entrepreneur. I've had a win and I've had a loss. <laughs> Lessons from both. Um, and I was, and I was that actually very, uh, you know, I, I was pretty well set on just retiring. I was like, look, done it twice. I think that's okay. Uh, branches had this, uh, business model that was just taken off like gangbusters and they had all like the good growth indicators. And more importantly, uh, they had just had this, you know, team that's, you know, very, very positive, uh, very fast, uh, CEO. I'm really a big fan of a TIFF, uh, felt that he was, uh, had the right, uh, core DNA to really take this thing to the next level uh, in the market. Uh, and so the thing that I was being brought on for was really about, hey, you know, we really need to uplevel this engineering team, product delivery, make sure, our, you know, what we are building is actually right as opposed to just, we're just building random things and trying different things out. Um, I would say that the lessons that I have brought to branch and then have been even more amplified during the pandemic is really comes down to one word and that's uh you, you really need to focus um you really need i mean that's i can't say enough knowing what makes you different and not just saying it but actually having data to prove it your customers tell you you know you gotta listen to your customers you know what do your customers tell you about why they pick you over all the other options that they might have um I've seen people where they kind of get caught up in their own echo chambers and they tell themselves why they're important and they tell themselves why the market values them versus actually going out and being a, you know, very objective about it and realizing actually this is why people buy our solution. And maybe the value that we need to really, you know, unlock is over here instead of what we aspire to be. And so that can create a little bit of a conflict, which is you have your aspirational goal, Founders are notorious for this. I mean, this is what makes them great, but also is a little bit of a curse at the same time is, you know, you create this world vision of what, the, you know, everything's going to be like, but there's also a reality check of why people buy your product today. And perhaps they don't need this big thing over here. They just need this one little thing. And that would unlock some very you know, important incremental value for your company. Um, the other thing that I would say too is, uh, when, when we run into these uh, harder financial times, um, in, uh, I'm wondering if people are familiar with uh, Rip Good Times uh, right from Sequoia. Yeah, good. 
that came around uh, back in 2008 and it really was all about, you know, hey, listen, you know, the good times are over. Um, the growth is, you know, that, you know, the easy money is gone. Um, and what was kind of funny about it was that Sequoia still ended up investing in a, in a lot of companies during that time. He really said that all the VC money was to try enough to kind of use it as a bargaining thing to drive down the value, have all the, you know, I guess, uh, folks with not quite as much appetite leave the table and then left them with as the only ones that could, you know, participate in these deals. So they got a better deal. Uh, that said, um, if you're looking for money, my point with bringing that up is if you're looking for money, it's not gone. You know, there's always somebody willing to invest. You just have, might have to take terms that you're not, you wouldn't normally be comfortable with. And so uh, you have to ask yourself, hey, you know, how much runway do I really have? Uh, and I think this pandemic has probably proven to a lot of folks that, you know, whoa, I thought I was pretty healthy until the hype goes away. And then now you kind of get refocused on bottom line value as opposed to top line value. You know, you're looking at being very efficient. Uh, if you can, you know, any costs that are, were sort of, you know, hand wavy because you were, you know, saying we're getting users or we're growing our core uh, unit economics, uh, those things need to be revisited and really thought through as whether or not uh, you can actually sustain uh, a healthy operation uh, with that type of spend. Um, also, I mean, the hard part here, so what I'm getting at is like streamlining operations for those of you that haven't done it um, or have found yourself uh, hesitant to do so, it might be getting a little late to do so and you, you might have problems later on. So the big takeaway from the Sequoia RIP thing was what's called the death spiral. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the death spiral, that's where you don't cut hard enough, fast enough. And by the time you can actually make the moves to, uh, and you realize how uh, you know, dangerous the financial situation you're actually in is, it's too late. And you, there is no move you can make at that point to avoid having to shut down your company. So that's a little bit morbid, feels a little negative. Uh, but the point is, is, is to, you know, this is, this is real, right? You're talking about the live, you know, the livelihood of your business. Uh, you need to be very, you know, pragmatic. Um, cutting headcount, uh, it's hard, but you know, if somebody doesn't provide immediate value, you can't say that how that person is generating revenue or how that person is contributing to cost reductions elsewhere. Um, maybe it's not a good time for that person to be on the bus. Yeah. So one thing is, you know, when, you know, one thing about your, you know, uh, square capital, uh, thing about like, you know, cut, you know, hard, quick, uh, one thing is, you know, when I talk with the, you know, startup founders or, you know, when I do my own. You know, I call it two types of growth. One is smart growth, and then the other is I call it hubris growth. You know, sometimes as mm. CEOs or founders, we like to like you know grow our companies very fast, and one of a sudden we say, you know, I'm hiring like ten people every month. You know, we are go doing great. We are growing, growing, growing. But then you know, a small turnover, turn, you know, something happens. Then you see that you know we just lay off fifty people, and versus you know, can we grow smart? Can we grow frugal? And then when these times are comes, you know, we can be much more nimble. We can say, you know, we have only a team of 25, but maybe we can let go immediately, maybe 10 or create a furlough or something. And, but we can be very nimble. So we can like, you know, we can see something and two hours later, you know, we have some decisions made. But when you are like, you know, uh, have like 500 people now, you know, uh, it's, I think that, you know, response can be way later because now you are dealing with a company that grew very fast and and some cases you know some people even you know shouldn't be there for a while uh, right. because it always happens like you know oh yeah let's bring our own digital marketing team like bring our you know bloggers bring this bring that and one of a sudden your your core team is still 25 people but you have these you know people that you know do are not creating so much value but they have like 200 people so from a uh, founder who grow company from like three people or, you know, one person to 500, how did you manage that growth, you know, uh, with, you know, especially with code 42? Yeah. Um, I would say 
that what you what you talk about like growing smart that's so important um just because you raise money or you uh, start finding yourself uh with a big contract um it's very important at that point actually not to just go out and hire people uh you should have a business reason to you know buy anything for your business everything is an investment and you should be able to model the return on it and if you can't then you probably shouldn't be buying that or uh, investing in it um i would say that there is a belief that fast growing companies add people really fast and i don't think that's true i think the fast growing companies have business models and they have they've tapped into some pent up demand and they're actually going out there and seizing it uh that results in you know large revenue growth uh rapid revenue growth um especially in this day and age i think there was a time where this stuff wasn't as well understood but now people are very very uh sharp on unit economics uh seeing the scaling functions and how these things are going to play out in one year two year time frames now that said it's really hard to predict things like a pandemic right um and then the longer term impact of that but uh i think it all comes back to if you understand your unit economics then you probably have built a business up to a point where you know where you can uh invest uh what type of assets you should be acquiring and what you expect the rate of return on those things to be over time uh for example some people just would go out and be very uh you know they oversimplify things and say well growth is growth and you know i can add as many people to the top line cost i want and that's just going to work out in the end um that's just not good business um you should know per head productivity uh you know how much revenue is each member of your sales team going to generate uh if you can't do that then you probably don't have a good repeatable sales model and those things are big question marks um running into things with uh uncertainty and hope is a that's a guarantee for your failure i i totally agree uh so you know i think we are in 23 minutes in the conversation so i may ask one more question then we can open it for q and a and according to the questions come you know i can continue asking questions but you know i really enjoyed this discussion again mitch you know i'm very grateful that uh, you are here and you know sharing all your you know uh, real experiences with us so um you know one more thing i will ask you know that you know you said that you know that your ai company failed and yeah. you know and the one thing is you know it all sometimes all these you know startup events like we invite people and everybody talks about triumphs and i always tell people like we know the triumphs but you know we don't learn from that and you know and because you know everybody says that oh i sold my company for 100 million dollars but lots of people don't understand that you know yesterday i was talking with a you know business you know founder in healthcare and he said that you know now my company is very sexy everybody wants to invest in it and but it took me 12 years to come here and and nobody you know i said that you know you know everybody thinks that you're a genius or everybody thinks that you are lucky and but nobody knows that you know 10 12 years of failures and you know hard work and you know uh so and you know from your ai company that failure what what is the you know like learning experience for you what you learn as the founder as the successful entrepreneur match got out of rumble yeah so um if you remember i said that uh, the the lesson i got from co42 is that you can do a lot of things wrong as long as you do one thing really right The lesson I got from Ramble is that you can do everything right and still get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had an all-star team. We had great backing, funding. Um, I definitely thought that uh, the second time around we were in a really hot space. I mean, it was artificial intelligence. Um, timing is important. I think we got the timing wrong. We were a little bit ahead of the curve on a few things. Uh, need versus nice to have is always important that's sometimes harder to see uh so i think we had a nice to have product uh that was a little bit early for the market and ultimately that would require a lot more capital to keep sustaining uh the growth of ramble uh and then i mean i even played through scenarios like had we actually managed to raise enough money to make it to to now, to now i would definitely glad that i'm not trying to run ramble through this thing <laughs> uh, you know i don't i don't know how i would have ran it through the pandemic that's uh uh the business model would have been very tough to uh keep going through this again because um we were focused on sales tools and 
you know, once you start running into things like this, you know, where you know, people aren't answering the phone for sales calls, then sales teams are getting let go. Uh, man, it would have been a tough one. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is, I think Ramble probably has more lessons for what I'd say are second time entrepreneurs. And I was actually told this by um, some of the folks at Excel. Uh, Excel is a, you know, world class VC. They had invested in Co42. And when I talked to those guys about when I was starting up Ramble, uh, you know, they're pretty, pretty blunt. They said, listen, you know, um, you gotta be careful because you've had success. And a lot of times, uh, second time founders, they skip steps. Uh, you can't just skip to a hundred million dollars. You can't just skip to even $10 million. You have to, you still have to go through all the work and you still have to figure out, you know, just, you know, what is your core value in the marketplace? Um, I think there are the things you can skip over is that, you know, you know, things around operational aspects, how to build a good deck, you know, messaging, communication, maybe you became a really good team leader. You have good management experience. Uh, you're better at firing people quick. Uh, you know, th those types of things are helpful, but strategy stuff and getting to your unit economics and repeatable processes where you're like, yeah, this thing's going operational. That stuff takes time. And you can't really shortcut the experimentation and learning required to get there. And so even from a, uh, maybe the lesson here, uh, as I'm kind of ad-libbing here, is that uh, I think I've, I know I've talked to folks who seek out advice from me and they say, hey, you know, um, I'm, it's my first time around. I'd love to have, you know, I'm thinking about bringing this person on board that's like from General Mills or they're from Target. They're like super VP of global blah, blah, blah. blah. And uh and, and you can't hire your way to success either at this early stage. You have to be very, very careful to make sure that you understand that this is a very specific type of game. And those people haven't played this game. Like they're probably really good to have maybe on, a, you know, as kind of a side advisor that might help you through some operational things. But the only people who have done your business is you. And, and hopefully you'll be the best one to do that business. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can definitely get strategic insights, like how do you penetrate a certain type of market? Can you walk me through this, you know, like, you know, contracts and, you know, things that are barriers to getting deals done. But when it comes to your business, nobody can do that except for you. And uh, you can't hire that out. Uh, well, I totally agree with you. Like, you know, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that I'm very, you know, uh, careful. I, I learned, I made so many partner mistakes in my life, like co-founders and, and especially, you know, like you are absolutely right. Like people are very, you know, like sometimes people send me these, you know, business plans and you open their, you know, team that there's 25 people there. I'm not saying you're a startup. How can you have 25 people? VP of this, VP of that. I say, you know, if you send me this, from get go, I, you know, I don't read this business plan because, you know, technically, you know, you have like showing off people that won't even talk to you 10 minutes right. and you need right. people who are passionate. Like, and one of my, you know, tests always, I tell people like, you know, if you are looking for a co-founder, you know, ask the question, like if shit going down at 2 a.m., if I knock your door in your apartment, you open the door with your PJs, you look at me and say, let's go and start working. That's the co-founder you are looking for. Yes. And if people yeah. say, oh, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that, that's not, you know, a startup lifestyle. And, you know, you know, this is passion, this is hard work, and this is full of constraints that you need to constantly deal with. And so, you know, I, I really, you know, uh, love that feedback, you know, Mitch, I think that's very relevant to, you know, all of us. So what I will do is, you know, I think we have last 20 minutes, so I will open this to, you know, Q&A. So any member can, you know, uh, you know, unmute and, you know, uh, or anyone in this, you know, uh, meeting right now, unmute himself or herself and ask any question to Mitch. And, you know, we'd like to continue as, you know, a kind of an interactive session. Great. So I'll, I'll jump in quick. Mitch, Mike Lewis, Click360. Um, we're about nine months in. Nice to meet you, by the way. I got, I, uh, I really enjoyed listening to a lot of this. I've gotten some really good notes out of this. Um, I love the idea of you can't shortcut experimentation um, and the learning process. How long do 
and I know it's probably iterative, but how long do you feel like it was before you had a really good feel for the process or, you know, was it always an ongoing thing? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a big question. Um, right. <laughs> it, it depends. And so, so uh, there's, a, if, if you're a second time entrepreneur, uh, investors will love to invest in entrepreneurs who are doing version two of the previous company <laughs> because then the shortcuts, a lot of the, that, that is a shortcut you can take is that you've done the experimentation in the same domain. Um, but I would say for the first time around, uh, get a customer and then find out what your customers say. You're like, that's, that's the best way you can learn. Uh, you can, one thing I have a real problem with is when you get into discussions with people and they're so inside their minds about things and they're not referring to data. They're talking about anecdotes and they're talking about opinions and just have to, you know, get some of the people's hands and learn what they like, what they don't like. And by the way, the negative is just as, you know, valuable as the positive. Just you know, it's, they're called hypotheses for a reason. Um, you can, you know, maybe it's a positive result, maybe it's a negative result, but you're going to learn from both. Um, I used to call this uh, a mortar shelling. You just fire the mortar and either you're somewhere on target or, or you're 180 degrees off, but you'll find out. <laughs> I hit something great or I didn't hit anything. That's, that's helpful too. Now we can move it somewhere. You know, you, you re-aim it. I like that analogy a lot. Thanks. You bet. Hi, it's Nathan Royce here. Um, working on a, a startup at the very beginning stages and um, I've been uh, kind of interested in these new funding models like indie VC or tiny seed that are more entrepreneur, I guess you could call it friendly from a certain perspective. Um, just wondering so your thoughts like, as, as micro VC. Is it kind of like, yeah, the, like or, going or, or, or boutique. Right, right. So I, as an alternative to like the traditional venture capital route, just wondering your thoughts since you've done the venture capital route successfully, uh, do yeah. you have any thoughts about this kind of alternative funding model that's that's becoming a little more prevalent at least? Thank you. Yeah, it, it really depends on your experience of managing capital, I think. Um, you know, there's money, there's smart money, there's dumb money. Um, there, there is such a thing as like, you know, I, I think capital being just capital, that's that's one thing. There are things that is just like you want to avoid is dumb money where you actually end up paying a lot more of your time and uh, education for maybe a very micromanaging uh, angel investor, for example, would be an example of dumb money that has no idea what type of business you're in, but definitely feel like they, their opinion should be heard by you daily. Um, that, that can be a real uh, bad, bad source of capital for a startup. Um, I'm not real familiar with, the, with, the, with some of these newer uh, you know, investment vehicles. Um, but I would say that, you know, just know what you're getting yourself into in terms of commitment. Uh, probably the thing that I like best about VCs, traditional VCs, is that there's a level of formality that they enforce. And what you want to kind of, you know, really, so people choose different routes because for different reasons. But one of the things I think is uh, not a good reason is because they believe that they don't want anybody interfering with their business. Um, there's so much to learn and you want good partners and good VC firms will get you, uh, you know, introduction to great partners. Uh, they'll help you on your go to market. They'll know people on boards that uh, just, you know, and also brand name matters. I mean, when people know that you're backed by Excel, I mean, Code 42's entire uh, you know, sales, uh, you know, our, our ability to do, get enterprise deals done changed literally overnight uh, the moment that Excel was on board because that's a real big vote of confidence. Uh, you know, we're, you know, in, in a way bonafide and anointed by the VC community at that point. Uh, you will get, if you're doing B2B and you're selling and trying to sell an enterprise, they will ask you in due diligence, you know, like, who are you backed by? And, you know, can the people who are back you write a big enough check if you get in trouble? Uh, those are all things that are, you know, very, very uh, positive and, and real about, uh, you know, going a traditional VC route. 
That said, I think um, Minnesota is a pretty tough place to raise capital. Um, I was going to ask uh, John and uh, maybe Casey later on, just, you know, like what's the climate been like for you guys? Uh, and what have you seen in terms of, you know, the VC market and interest here? Because uh, I know that I had to actually go outside the state to uh, raise my rounds at Ramble. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just like, can you get money? <laughs> and that becomes the, you know, the driving force. But if you do have the choice and if you have, you know, what you believe is a pretty valuable, you know, if your business is valuable and you believe that the, it's solving a pretty big market need, uh, you know, VCs will see it in a small VC versus a large VC versus a micro VC. Uh, if there's value there and they're competent, uh, they'll all see it. So um, it depends on how much you want to raise, how much control you want to give up. I think all the standard calculations probably still apply. Uh, the thing that you are giving up, though, of course, is probably access to uh, some top-notch, you, know, uh, you know, partners and uh, and people that uh, you can make intro introductions to. I hope that answers. Thank you. you. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And actually, uh, I'm noticing that Crash Plan is doing a backup on my Mac as we speak. So thanks for creating that as well. <laughs> wow. Appreciate sure. your time today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. One thing, Nathan, is you know tomorrow it's very interesting that you know uh, one of our sessions with our you know Supreme Court is. We are bringing an indie VC, you know, uh, scout to talk about, you know, alternative capital uh, models. And one thing about indie VC is uh, they don't invest in companies. For example, a venture capital can invest a MVP product that, you know, uh, you, they see some momentum uh, or a, you know, a beta product that the momentum is there. So it's growing, but you may need, you know, uh, maybe, you know, uh, one more year or six more months to have, you know, really showing great revenue. But in the VC, you know, they want to invest, you know, they don't want to invest in companies that their, you know, uh, revenue cycle is one or two years, be, you know, uh, far away. So they don't make investments early on. And, and if you are like a company that, you know, you are, you know, your revenue cycle can generate, you know, your company can generate revenues pretty quickly. Uh, so for example, they don't invest in healthcare. And so they don't go and say, you know, I will make, give you money, $1 million. And then you know, maybe in two years, you will start generating revenue. And uh, they don't invest that. And, but if they invest in a company that's generating revenue, the one thing, good thing about them is, you know, uh, if you pay them 3x return, you may buy back your share. So it can give you much more mm -hmm. uh, flexibility from that. You know, you can own your equity. But one other thing I learned in my experiences is, you know, the, the minimum you need to get from an investor is the money, but they need to come with, you know, partnership deals. They need to come with lots of knowledge. They need to come with connections because connections build companies. And like, if a VC, like, you know, mix said, like, you know, if Excel comes and says, you know, Excel have lots of great relationships with, you know, General Motors and one of a sudden, you know, you sign a deal with GM and Ford and, you know, that's like type of an investor you want because, because now we are fully aligned uh, with their interests because the more business you bring, uh, their value goes up, they make more money. But if you bring an investor every week, they ask you, give me some KPIs, you know, give me some presentations. The problem now, you are managing a investor instead of you are managing your company. And so that's the thing like, you know, you need to work, find those smart investors because every money is not a good money for a startup and it can kill you very quickly. So yeah, I, I can't agree with that more. I, I've seen uh, uh, companies uh, totally take their eye off the ball and over tilt them building great investment decks, um, you know, like not really understanding what drives their business, but yet creating brief, pretty sophisticated financial models way too early. Um, it's okay to say, you know what, it's too early. I think that's a really important thing, especially for uh, companies that are just getting going. Uh, you're, you're in your experimentation cycle. People get it. The, the smart ones will say, yeah, you guys shouldn't be doing these things. You guys shouldn't be you know, spending your time trying to fill out all this, you know, like reporting information or what would be, you know, operational for uh, maybe a much later stage company uh, when you're just trying to get, you know, customers one, two, and three done. So it's okay to say we're not ready. It's too early. Yes. One thing is, you know, last week in our one of our core session, you know, uh, the clearance from, you know, the founder of Opsi was there and he's like very blunt about it. He said, you know, I only go for one or two KPIs and I do it like detailed 
and then those KPIs align with your investors, you get money. You know, it's, uh, it's easy to get money when the investors understand that you know the metrics, you know the what, you know, the growth yes. factors of your company to the core. And yeah. but you don't need to create a dashboard. We are not in the business of creating 500 KPIs and creating sexy dashboards. We are in the business of growing companies. So, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. Is that you really understand your unit economics? It usually boils down to just a uh, maybe. You should be able to count your KPIs on, on one hand at most. Those are the things that move the needle. Um, don't get caught up in the derivative ones. Good we question. still have time, guys. You know, you don't need to be shy. We are all startup founders, or dealing, you know, or starting our companies, or we are a part of this community. So. So there's no need to be shy. Hey, I have a quick question for you. Um, this is Matt, uh, Matt DeCure. I run a business in the realm of hiring. Uh, Mitch, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. This has been like, I feel like so many of the things that you said just like resonate. It's like, yeah, that makes so much sense. And just hearing it from, from an external place helps a lot. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm especially curious to hear about is, um, sort of just like kind of how you were feeling as a business owner amid, um, I guess, the recession in 2008, but also, you know, around the dot-com dot bubble and specifically like, I'm sure I'm not the only one thinking about should my business pivot according like to, to sort of adjust for changing market dynamics, um, like, and also maybe the business shuts down. And I know that you just went through the experience of shutting down Ramble too. So I'm curious to hear just sort of like, what you were thinking through um, in those times. Yeah. Um, well, I can definitely talk to the actual like shutdown process, but I'm, I'm not sure that's what you're asking here. Uh, again, I, I'd probably say that I just didn't know enough to know how much I probably should be concerned at that time. You know, we just knew that we were trying to start things and uh, we actually didn't, you know, there, there wasn't really uh, an option for us not to do what we were doing. Um, we were trying to build business. We were trying to go after the customers. Um, we definitely were seeing a slowdown in different areas. And so we just kept focusing on the things that were working. Uh, even if it meant it was just, you know, a single deal with Stanford. Um, we were doing some consulting work as well. Uh, but that was definitely starting to slow down and get a hit from, I'm talking about 2008. Uh, the dot com, I mean, we were just getting going. It was either we we're going to start a business or we weren't. <laughs> we'd have to go get jobs. Uh, so I'm not sure if that one's as applicable, but I think this, this situation is very different. I mean, the, it's not like it's going to be like this forever. Things are going to change though. I think that's where I would start putting, you know, my strategic lens is, so what does change now? Work, for example, we're doing this. This probably isn't going to go anywhere, right? This is like the new norm for a while working from home, working remotely, if your business has, uh, you know, some way to, you know, you know, draft off of this, you know, new way of life, that might be something interesting, right? A lot of the food delivery folks uh, uh, or delivery systems, they start figuring out that, hey, wait a second, like, we just need to pivot this thing around this whole fact that people work from home now, they still need to eat lunch. Um, yeah, so I, th I think, uh, in every, in, like I said, every downturn there's a silver lining and so i think concentrations of value start to show up and you just need to know where those concentrations are and you have to see if do those apply to your business yes or no some businesses are just going to go they're just going to go under right they're just they just there's no fit anymore and this thing's just or they just don't have enough runway and and that's that's just too bad um because these you know things like this do happen they just don't happen every you know two, three, four years, they happen like once every 10 years, right? And so those are hard cycles to, you know, really predict. Great, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Sure. Yeah. Mitch, this is... Oh. Hey, Sanji, how are you? Good, how are you, Tian? Thank, thank you for putting this together. So Mitch, uh, my name is Sanji, I'm with JP Morgan. You talked oh. about, you know, uh, this whole idea of like connectivity. Could you please talk about the importance of partnerships, not just with your VC or the funders, but just advisors from CPA, banking, uh, attorneys, and how you've 
leverage some of those during hard times? Yeah, I think um, I think I think part of it is also I mean when you're starting out as a founder, I mean you're expected to know so much and you have to learn so much so fast. Um, all of a sudden, and, and I think one of the you know trade-offs that every good founder makes is what are you going to be an expert at and what aren't you going to be an expert at? And you should be an expert in your business because nobody else is going to be an expert in your business, but you don't have to be a CPA. Okay. Um, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a, you know, know everything about intellectual you know, property and you know, be an IP lawyer. Uh, so I think uh, partnerships should all be about, you know, like, Hey, do your core very well. And then partner with great people that do, you know, uh, you know, supporting, uh, supporting roles in your business. Um, I think a lot of times too, uh, people want to try and hire these people too soon and partnering is a great way to just, you know, Hey, you know, let's try this out. Let's date before we get married, you know, um, let's try some things, you know, you know, try a few deals together. Maybe it's a contract lawyer, uh, looking over enterprise deals. Um, maybe it's a compliance person helping you navigate healthcare, uh, finance might be something about like, Hey, you know, like, can you just review VC deals for me? Those things you don't need to, I mean, you should be aware of them and you should know enough to know when somebody's pulling the wool over your eyes, but teaming up with, uh, great folks on partnerships. Um, yeah. If it's not core to your business, that's a great opportunity to, you know, leverage resources around you. Thank you. Absolutely. We have last few minutes. I think we can get one more question. Justin here. I have a question. Uh, when you developed the backup plan for Mac and you mentioned it was only at 1% market share, was that mm -hmm. the core part of your business or was that just a side part backing up for Macs that took over in the end? So that was a passion decision. Um, we loved Macs. So we needed to back up our own machines. We ran Macs. Um, yeah. It was no more complicated than that. I, I wish I could tell you I had a ton of business acumen and I was super savvy and I predicted where the max were going to go in the future. It just so, I mean, like I said, sometimes things are just lucky. I think it's not lucky. It's sometimes we can turn our needs into businesses and most of the time it comes because that's the reason like, you know, I always tell people like, you know, we, we hear these big triumphs and big stories like, oh, I sold my company a billion dollars. But I always ask them, you know, like ask the founder, like, why did he get the idea? And most of the time it's relates to a need. It's relates to something not working. And then you start building on it. And then you constantly, you know, go back and forth in an agile method. And then, you know, uh, a company brewing in your hands. Because that's the reason everybody thinks that, you know, these founders, we are all like these geniuses. We are not. Like we find some need or something that we need. And we try, we have the guts to build it. So. Yeah. So that, you know, uh, Be, being your own uh, number one customer really helps. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, if you don't like your own product, you shouldn't be selling it to a second person. So, not at all. <laughs> so, I think we are at 2 p.m. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we should, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, this was a very engaging conversation. And it's always nice to talk to Mitch. You know, I personally love his stories and, you know, and, you know, he's a good friend of mine and I really enjoy how hopefully we'll get more friendlier. And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. Sorry for my phone. Yeah. Um, hey, thanks so much for the time. I did want to leave folks with uh, a couple of points. Uh, one is, uh, you know, even though this can be a pretty uh, negative time, it can be a little depressing is, uh, you know, stay positive, um, make the hard decisions now uh, that if you haven't made them, uh, it may not be too late. So definitely if there's something that you've been considering doing that's you know, around cost cutting, uh, this isn't going away overnight. So, you know, think about that, you know, get to a decision quickly, uh, but you should also view it as a healthy opportunity. Um, these are things that might just make your business that much stronger in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Mitch. This was Thank great. Thank you.